We welcome you to this very special installment of the P2 Podcast. It is a Q&A, questions by you, answers by us. Um, we welcome you from wherever you're tuning in, whether it be Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, wherever we'll take our money. We hope you enjoy and welcome. So we're going to do our best to be as efficient as possible on this episode and make sure that we're getting right into the subject matter. So high level, um, I posted a Q&A on my Instagram story yesterday just to see if we could get some interesting questions to be able to go over on today's episode. And there were a few that I thought would be good material for us to go into more depth on. Um, I could have answered them on my story, but these were probably a little bit more conversation worthy. So the first one is how important is sleeping eight hours a night to maximizing muscle growth and recovery? So Chris, tell me about sleep. Um, I mean, I think the question comes from the right place and the fact that sleep is an under prioritized component of growth, pro progress, et cetera. Um, the, the fixation on eight, I think is where you, you draw in the, the context, right? Um, I know people who can operate very well on four hours of sleep every single night, you know, and that's, that's what they do. I know people who cannot do anything if they don't get eight to nine hours a night. Obviously we have sleep cycles, REM sleep. There are very important things that happen, especially when it comes down to like your brain and your brain being able to run your body, um, you know, with lack of sleep that degrades pretty quickly. So eight hours, uh, I, I would say is probably the space where I'm like, eh, I don't know if eight hours is necessarily important, but is it important to get really adequate, restful, um, substantial sleep? A hundred percent. It's, it's very important. And if you're not getting very restful sleep, very adequate sleep, it will definitely temper your ability to continue to progress and make the gains you want to make. Yeah. I, I, I think that the focus on eight as a magical number is probably a little bit overhyped, but the thing is, is that it's also just a really easy marker for most people to shoot for, which is why I think it has become so popular. So like what you said, obviously there's a lot of variability within the population as like what people need to be a good enough amount of sleep for recovery, for muscle growth, for general brain function, for longevity, for health, all of those things, right? But we also know that as soon as you start dropping below that critical threshold of sufficient sleep, really bad shit starts to happen really, really quickly. Um, you know, not even just the inability to recover or, you know, the, the fatigue or, you know, poor impulse control, which are like all signs and symptoms of lack of sleep or poor quality sleep. Um, but also just like long-term brain health effects, mm -hmm. like, um, I haven't seen the, the research lately, but I know that in the past I've seen studies and I've seen, um, you know, people talking about how detrimental lack of sleep is for your brain health and like how it's linked to, um, you know, Alzheimer's it's linked to, um, just various, various disorders and diseases of the brain. And, you know, for most people that are young, they don't really think about that. And, for myself, I've been in the position of trying to operate on, you know, three, four, five hours of sleep every night and convincing myself at times effectively that I am that person who only needs four or five hours of sleep a night. Like I don't need any more or I'm incapable of getting more. But, you know, the reality is there are maybe 0.01% of the people in the world that are in that only need four or five hours of sleep category to be their sufficient level most people a gigantic majority of people are going to fall in that like seven to nine hours is what they need for their sufficient levels of recovery of brain health of you know fatigue reduction all that stuff and that's where eight comes from mm -hmm. right? like eight is just a good middle ground number for the vast majority of the population um if you're getting six hours of sleep how detrimental is that well on like a one night basis, probably not that big of an issue. But the thing with lack of sleep is that it compounds very, very, very quickly. So if you get six hours one night and you get, you know, eight, nine, 10, the next three nights, you're probably okay. It's not gonna be that big. Mm -hmm. If you get six, six, five, six, 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 that's extremely problematic. 
And like that is going to show up in your performance. That's going to show up in your muscle muscle building potential. That's going to show up in your your fat loss potential and your body composition and all of those things. And it's really easy to write off sleep as something that is less important than nutrition or or performance and training in the gym or whatever else it might be because those strategies feel a little bit more active right and sleep feels much more like it's something operating in the background and like you you don't have to exert any energy while sleeping so it feels like something that should not be as important as the others but we all know it is important right it's just it's yeah. just a lot easier to push it to the background and say oh i'm fine i i don't need as much sleep i'm i'm just that outlier person that can make progress on four or five hours of sleep. But again, like I said, I've been there before and I've been the type to try and go through every single day on four or five hours of sleep and to stimulate the fuck out of myself and run myself into the ground, go to the gym at, you know, nine or 10 PM, because that's really the only time during the day that I have. And then, you know, wake up at five, 6 AM and do it all over again. But the reality is like, looking back on that, I, I know that I was severely handicapping my ability to make progress and if eight hours is something that is like this insurmountable target and like the idea of eight hours is stressful because of that number then maybe it's not the best idea to focus on eight right. but most people probably like 95 percent of people need to be getting around seven plus hours of sleep to be like sufficiently recovered um and then everything else just kind of like trickles down from that yeah, I will um, have a response to that just as like a, a piggyback for people listening um, who may or may not be getting enough sleep because I know you and I have both have our had our bouts, right? Like I, I worked for Stryker and then med sales. I was on call for surgeries all the time. I regularly operated on four to five hours of sleep and I probably only in not in a great space because I'm in surgery and I'm, I'm helping surgeons, you know, save lives. Uh, but um, that didn't sound so important at all. But the idea that I was doing something that was very repetitive is the reason why I was able to probably continue to keep going. Like, I'm like, hey, it's the same thing over and over and over again, right? Because um, you can almost kind of feel yourself wake up when something out of the ordinary happens. You go, you know, because your body's trying to operate on as little as possible because it knows it doesn't have much to give. Um, you mentioned something that's interesting because people do generally devalue, devalue sleep and if you ask someone to think about it, it's kind of one of those like, huh, what questions? Because it's like, what's more important, food, water, or sleep? And I think most people will go, oh, oh wait, for sure sleep, right? Because like you get, you get, you're taught about, well, what you put in your body matters. Make sure you're hydrated. You hear those things over and over and over again, and you don't really hear a whole lot about sleep, quality of sleep. Um, I think it's kind of catching on now with the devices that will allow you to track those things. Um, and then like things like meditation and breath work, et cetera, all the things that go into being able to allow your body the, the opportunity to those, those spaces of reprieve, whether it be sleep, whether it be just quiet spaces and, and whatnot. So, um, it's interesting because I just Googled the, the answers to the worldwide, the longest someone's gone without food, longest someone's gone without water and longest someone's gone without sleep. Cause I was watching reruns of house yesterday and I heard the record for as long as someone who had uh, gone without sleep, which was 11 days, right? 11 days without sleep before the brain, it's just catastrophic, right? Like everything starts going bad, shut down, it's its over, right? And so for water, 18 days. Yeah, that doesn't And for food, it's like a month. Yeah. Right? And so it's, it's interesting that like, it's not, it's, you know, two thirds, right? Before, um, before water, like you're going to start shutting down pretty quickly before you know oh you would even need to take a sip to stay alive your brain needs sleep and i think that's pretty interesting to to think about and when you frame it that way i think it kind of places a more apparent importance on like okay wait a second i need to really focus on being good at sleeping yeah and i think as this question pertains to like performance right if you're someone who is intentionally doing all of the other things that would be maximizing your performance in the gym, your strength, your muscle building potential, your, you know, eating a fuck ton of food, sticking to your macros, training hard as shit. You're paying, you know, a thousand dollars a month for coaches and PEDs and all of this. That's all fine and dandy. And you can tell yourself that like, you're really going above and beyond and you're doing more and you're working harder than everyone else. 
But what's funny to me is that all of that is equated with like hard work, right? Like doing, but if you think about sleep and what is equated with hard work, it's less sleep, right? People talk about working hard. They think about sleeping less. Mm -hmm. And it's almost seen as like a badge of honor to say, I don't sleep that much because I am so busy. I'm working so hard. I'm doing so much more than you or this other person, right? But that's actually such bullshit. Like we, like we think about this glamorizing of sleep deprivation and like, like almost like torturing ourselves, which like, that's literally what sleep feels like. If you, if you do not get enough sleep, it feels like you're being fucking tortured. Like it's miserable. You, you can't think clearly. You feel just completely wiped out. Your body hurts. Like it's, it's a shitty feeling, but like there is that equating of harder work in less sleep which in my mind doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make from a logistical standpoint. Yeah. If you're pulling 20 hour days doing like, you know, some really hard laborious work or labor like that, that, that makes sense if you would not be getting that much sleep, but most people aren't thinking in those terms. They're thinking in terms of like, especially performance, right? They're like, I'm going to the gym. I'm like, you know, eating and sticking to my macros. I'm taking my supplements. Like I'm talking to my therapist. Like I'm doing all this, like this, it's like self-improvement stuff where right. for some reason it's so fucking hard for people to get enough sleep and we're to take that as seriously as the other measures right and like getting eight or nine hours of sleep once out of seven days feels like good enough right you're like that you throw yourself a party if you're like holy shit i got enough sleep today like that's great right well you know six out of seven days or five six hours if you were to view your macros like that you would be a catastrophic failure mm -hmm. But most people, they have this like cognitive dissonance whenever it comes to sleep versus these other measurables and metrics that are associated with muscle gain or strength gain or progression or, you know, performance or whatever. But again, just thinking out loud here and just going back to what you said, like there's an argument to be made that sleep is more important than hard training. It's more important than, you know, sufficient nutrition. And it gets swept under the rug so easily and there are yeah. excuses that are so readily made for bad or poor insufficient sleep that no one would even think to use for training or nutrition or even supplementation. So yeah. it is interesting how everyone, know, like we all know, we all know if someone asks us how important is sleep, you're like, oh, it's super fucking important. We all know we can say that we can give that regurgitated answer. But whenever it comes to actually implementing positive sleep habits, into our lives and going to bed at you know 9 p.m to wake up at 5 a.m we all just like we can't take that necessary step and i'm i'm the same way i struggle with it yeah. but it is interesting again talking through it that we we do so much outside of the absolute easiest shit in the world that doesn't take any additional effort sleep doesn't take any additional effort so easy doesn't take any extra money yeah but we all struggle with it yeah it's it's interesting because and i, I think i know why and just with anything there's there's tangible like i know when i'm dehydrated right like you know the feeling of being dehydrated in a day like i haven't drank much water today you know when you're hungry right and you know when you've had a slew of not drinking enough water for multiple days or eating shittily for multiple days i think with sleep is so hit or miss for some people right i know for me like it can be hit or miss until you get into those habits but hold on oh, hear me out Oh, yeah, yeah. Until, until you get into those habits, right? So until you've chained your circadian to be as natural as possible, you fall asleep at a time, you wake up at a time, you get all the cycles that you need to get, you get the REM you need. Because there are times where I sleep for eight, nine hours and I wake up and I'm like, I could go back to sleep. You know, like, fuck this. Like, I did not get restful sleep. I did not feel good. And so I think that because sometimes there's that, there's not that one to one that, like, I know for sure if I sleep an extra hour, I'm going to be 15% better tomorrow right? Because you don't have that direct correlation, I think we devalue it. But we know that just like with anything, with nutrition, with training, it takes consistency, it takes time. It's not an exact science. Um, it's it's patternistic and it's going to be ambiguous at times. And so again, like you said, it takes no extra effort. When you finish your day, you know, we work long days and then the ladies are like, hey, like I want to hang out and watch movies with you or let's play games. Let's play with the dogs. And you're like, okay, it's like seven 
I'm going to go to bed at nine, right? And before you know it, you watch two episodes of something, you need to make dinner, you need to take the dogs out. And it's like, all right, well, now it's nine. And like, I wanted to be in bed and asleep by nine. And so now you're laying in bed and it's like, all right, well, do you want to turn want to fall asleep? And now you're watching an episode of House and it's 9.30, it's 10 o'clock and you're finally falling asleep and you're way off, you know, your mark. Um, the urgency, I think, is lacked in the fact that if I knew for a fact that, hey, dude, not only are you going to wake up easier and when your 4.30 alarm goes off, but you're going to be more awake, you're going to be better, you're going to be, you know, smarter, you're going to be able to speak more clearly. Um, these are all very tangible things. You know for sure what will happen tomorrow. I would probably be easier for me to be like nope sorry i'm not watching that extra episode or i'm just going to turn the tv off or i'm going to read a book until i fall asleep or whatever that happens to be right um and i think that is probably the biggest thing that holds people back so i would encourage people to instead of shoot for the arbitrary eight nine hours just shoot for like what i've been doing is trying to just go out a little bit earlier hey let's just go to bed like 15 30 minutes earlier than we did yesterday let's do it again let's do it again because i did the same thing with getting up early right like you know, I didn't just start going from getting up at seven to getting up at, you know, four thirty. I was like, I only get up at six thirty, then six, then five thirty. Uh, um, and so I'm trying to do the same thing with my sleep and just develop those habits. And then on the days when I have opportunities to lay on the couch for eight minutes or so, instead of turning on the TV, I'm just gonna close my eyes. I'll close my eyes, get some more rest, um, because I do understand the value there. And it's low hanging fruit. You don't have to do anything extra, it's just more of what you're not doing. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to mention before we move on to the next was, well, A, we definitely should have done more homework coming into this because sleep is one of those like very research laden mm -hmm. topics. And we're just coming into this like guns blazing and just we're, we're free balling it. So it's fine. Um, but the next one was something I was thinking as we were talking about this and we probably should have honestly led with this point, but eight hours of sleep time is somewhat arbitrary because what is more important is sleep cycles. Yeah. And for a lot of people who don't actively measure their sleep or their sleep quality, it's very hard to understand how many sleep cycles you actually go through at night. But in my mind, I was like, why do I, I feel like it's like six sleep cycles per day that you need, but I just looked it up and it it's like four to six. I think like four to six is what is what is optimal or recommended. Um, but the important thing there is that you have to actually be able to go through full sleep cycle because that is the restorative aspect of sleep. It's going through these different phases of deep sleep, REM sleep, and then coming back out. That's what actually allows you to go through a, again, restorative sleep or restorative, um, you know, overnight process, whatever the best fucking way of thinking about that is. And yeah. the other thing that's very important too is your internal body temperature dropping as well as your heart rate. So these are things that happen slowly throughout the night as you get closer to waking up in the morning, just as in line with your circadian rhythm as well, you have these quantitative measures that follow closely along with your sleep progression and the time that you're actually in bed. So while sleep cycles are definitely important, the total time that you're in bed does make a difference for things like your heart rate and things like your internal body temperature to be able to slowly decline to the point where you're about to wake up so all in all sleep is a fucking super complicated topic um but at the same time understanding how important sleep is and this is under or another reason why i recommend that people figure out some way of qualitatively tracking their sleep not just time spent in bed yeah so like we both have aura rings um they're a little bit expensive but like I highly recommend that people get some kind of aura ring or I know Apple watches will track sleep at least to some degree. I'm not sure how accurate Apple watches are, but they do that as well. And there are other devices too, but just looking at the clock and measuring, you know, eight hours isn't sufficient enough, especially if you are focused a lot on performance or focused on hypertrophy or anything like that. Like if you're spending hundreds, thousands of dollars a month on supplements and PEDs and coaches and gym memberships and food and all this stuff but your sleep is still the limiting factor. It might be a good idea for you to invest in something like some kind of device, like an aura ring to be able to give you those measures, to be able to give you more data so that you can track and then improve as well. So that's what I wanted to end on. Let's go into the next one because that was a very long one. I, I said 10 to 15 minutes. That was fucking long. All right. So next question, which program would lead to more hypertrophy? 
an all free weight program or all machines? And then as a correlate to that question, what about strengths? Would the free weight or machine-based program do better? So Chris, what do you think about that? Oh, the, the machines versus free weight conversation. We love this one, don't we? Um, the one that works, right? So <laughs> I, so I find, and I know that's a very asshole generic statement, but the, the thought process is here and I'll, I'll paint this with actually just a, a true client example. If I have a novice client, which I did training in her gym, her home gym, which has a barbell, a couple dumbbells, a bench, a TRX system, right? That I told her to buy. Um, we're going to make progress. We're going to do some really cool things. And then there's going to come, come a point where she is now strong enough and capable enough to continue to push and drive intensity in these movement patterns. But technically, she's not all the way there. So her ability to push is going to be dwarfed by just the stability of the movement, right? Just the lack of prowess and expertise there. This is where I like to, as a coach, lean into a machine to supplement. Hey, we're not going to forsake the ability or sorry, forsake the focus of trying to become more and more technically sound in these free weight patterns. But I also don't want to stop us and our pressing pattern, our squat pattern, our hinge patterns, because we need to focus on form. Let's do that. And also let's go to a safe place, like a machine, like a leg press, whatever, where I'm like, Hey, kill yourself, have fun. Because I know you're gonna be fine. Like for the most part, like you're gonna be fine there. As long as we maintain a, a decent level of focus and concentration on bracing and breathing properly and stuff like that. And so I can do a lot more there than I could with a, a dumbbell in front of you as you're like starting to lean forward because your upper back's giving out and stuff like that. So say a lot to say that obviously the best is a combination of both. I actually prefer pop out, bro. I, I, I said the best combination of both. I said, but I'm going to answer the question. All right. I lean on machines. I lean on machines. Machines are safe. Machines are safe. And I can have people drive a lot of intensity and push really, really hard and continue to grow and progress on a machine a lot more safely uh, than I can with free weights. So that is that. As far as strength is concerned, I think strength is an ambiguous measure, right? Strength in what? Right. So, uh, yeah, a bench press, a squat, a deadlift is like, well, then you need, you need free weights. You need to get comfortable with this bar and this pattern. Um, but if you're asking if I'm, I'm training an NFL lineman, I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to use any of those patterns. I want to use very dynamic patterns. I want him being strong, quote unquote, in those patterns. Um, so strength is a, is a bit more of a, a multi-layered answer, but if we're speaking like strictly like in the realms of like powerlifting, then yeah, I mean, I think free weights are definitely going to be more repertory for someone who's trying to get strong in those patterns because they're doing those patterns more often. Yeah. So obviously the question leads out a lot of context, but I think that's kind of the idea, right? It's like yeah. trying, to, yeah. trying to like separate this into like just different hypothetical worlds of one world has only machines. One world has only free weights. Now do your best, right? Like create the best program, create the the best environment for either muscle growth or strength and just see, see which one wins. Right. right. Um, in my mind, ironically, I think that the machine world would win in both. And I think that that becomes even more pronounced the higher up the advancement ladder you get. And like you said, um, I will, I'll caveat this with. I'm not talking about strength as in like functional real world strength. I'm talking about strength as in absolute ability of a muscle to generate force. And that, and I'm also not even saying power, right? Because power implies velocity and like the ability to move something quick, but like a machine obviously has some limitations on that. So I'm, I'm thinking just purely in terms of force generation for a muscle. Um, but you know, I would, I would tend to, to gravitate more towards machines. And I think this is also coming from someone who has at various times been working out, out of like a exclusively private gym with very little in the way of machine options. And then also someone who has at various times gone to a gym that has like the most extensive amount of wild ridiculous machines you could ever think of for pretty much any 
movement pattern, right? Like, I mean, right. fucking American Barbell has like the yeah, most fucking crazy ever with like prime prime machines that allow you to like overload different aspects of the range of most like it like crazy fucking machines. Um, and also one extra assumption here that I'm making is that the machines are actually built to fit the anatomy of the yeah. as well, because that's an important, important contextual point is that not all machines are made, made, created equal for every single demographic, right? So if you're very short, if you're very tall, if you're very wide, not every machine is going to be useful for you. And I'm thinking of this in terms of like the other day I was at, at the gym and I was doing a machine chest press and I could not find a comfortable width on the handle because it would, it just ended too narrow, no matter how wide on the handles I, I moved my hands out whenever I locked out the press it was just too narrow it felt weird on my wrists felt weird on my elbows and I'm like this machine is shit for me it's just never gonna work, right um but you can extrapolate that out to pretty much any machine make model that you want to think of for any muscle group it's made it's made to fit the median right it's made to fit the absolute middle of the bell curve and then from there everyone else has to conform around whatever that machine is created for free weights don't have that problem so that's the benefit of free weights. All right. All of that to say, I do think that machines offer the best, the, the best total package whenever it comes to ability to isolate a specific muscle for hypertrophy specifically, and also the ability to train close to and beyond failure without risk of injury or with less risk of injury. So we always use the example of like a leg press versus a squat, right? If, if I'm wanting to train my legs effectively, I choose a leg press. If I want to improve a squat pattern, I choose a squat, obviously, right? right. But if I'm trying to get stronger, I might even choose a leg press, right? If I'm trying to make my legs stronger, then I don't want my low back or my lungs to be the limiting factor there or my fucking shoulder mobility, holding a bar on my back. Right. So there's a lot of things that are are limiting within free weights themselves that in this idealistic world of, of machines only, we're thinking about ways of creating machines that work with pretty much any anatomy and any type of person. So I would say, um, I would say that I think that machines would actually end up being best for both hypertrophy and strength provided that all of those other assumptions are adhered to. But at the same time, I will also say I could see a scenario in which free weights would be better than machines for both, um, which kind of goes back to your point of we should think about ways of incorporating both into a good program um, just because we don't live, live in an idealistic machine world and we don't live in in a free weight world where you know everything is perfect and injuries never happen and, you know, we can progress indefinitely with no no issues and all shit, right? So there are benefits to both, but um, you know, I think if I had to choose between the the perfect machine based movement versus the perfect free weight movement for pretty much any individual, I would almost always choose a machine. Same, yeah. I I think that obviously our response is big for more context, but I actually don't think it needs context in the question so much as it is context in the goal and context in the client right so i think that if for me like in my general approach is if we're working with an aesthetic client i don't need you to be able to throw a football i don't need you to be able to sprint but i'd like you to be able to run and do things overhead but i'm not going to have you do really hard things overhead i'm not going to have you run sprints regularly because they're going to count they're going to be counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve so i'll use machines to do the things that we're trying to achieve, right? I'm going to continue to push intensity here, continue to overload here. But I also don't want you to break. I don't want you to try to stand up or move in a non-linear pattern and just like end up contorted and all fucked up. Yeah. So that's where the more functional, maybe free weight, um, transverse patterns, those those things are going to come in. Is like, hey, like I want you to be able to be able to like walk around, be a functional human being. But that could be flipped on its head entirely when you talk about an athlete who is a field athlete or a court athlete. Where it's like, hey, listen, yeah, we're going to use machines to get pumps and activate and stuff like that. But a lot of our movement patterns are going to be simulatory. They're going to be things that you do in game. Right? I want you to do this really strong as a lineman. I need you to get out of a three-point stance into a bag as strong and powerfully and as quickly as possible. So 
the training pattern is can be completely inverted based on who you're talking about. So I think that it's definitely more of a goal oriented as far as like goal client, goal client prospects, like goal client prospect, goal client direction. Um, and that would probably would have given us a bit more context on how we wanted to design this world. No, man, part of me just wants to go into talking about that Joel Seedman dude and his style of training, because I think that in a way that is like very correlated to this conversation in general and talking about like the specificity of an exercise versus the specificity of the goal that you're after and yeah. how linear those have to be related. But I'm going to bite my tongue because I think actually we maybe want to do like a full episode specifically about that because yeah, that is something I could probably talk about for a really fucking long time, but we're going to move on. We're going to move on and look at us. Good we're going to fucking write this down right now. So I don't forget about this. No, I mean, it's a great topic. I mean, I think machines versus free weights, the context that comes with it. And also I think the polarization that is in the space around the conversation, um, begs that to be a, a really good conversation. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of like visual misinformation associated with stuff like that, right? Like whenever you see people doing these like ridiculous looking movements that are sport specific, right? In intuitively, it makes sense, right? If you see someone who is a, a baseball player swinging a sledgehammer back and forth like this, you're looking at that and you're like, I can see it, right? Like obviously that's training for a sport, but you have to have a really deeper under really deep understanding of like biomechanics and exercise science and also like how muscular and neurological adaptations happen to be able to understand how you actually improve at patterns and how you improve at incorporating things into a sport specific performance too. So I don't even think the thing is, is I, I don't think that this is necessarily like a failure of, of like communication or education or like, you know, information Dispose, not disposal, but like dispensing or yeah. um, dispersion of information. Wow, Jesus fucking Christ. Um, because I think that it's just something that you, your eyes fail you. The eye test fails you with stuff like that. Yeah. So unless you're what I would consider to be like, you know, relative expert in the field, you're always going to have your own internal biases be affirmed by things that look very similar to what a sport or what the goal is should be right if it's going to be mimicking it in your head it makes sense at, that it should look like that as well yeah. but anyway longer longer conversation to a future date all right last question and then we will get the fuck out of here all right so do the abs need to be trained directly or are heavy compounds good enough mm. this is another one of those questions where like what is your goal would have been really good uh like uh addendum add-on um i'm gonna say that that's that's like the place to start the, the answer you know what i mean it's like start yeah. the goal yeah exactly um so yeah i honestly think i think if your goal is just to be a well-rounded individual if your goal is to be strong um i mean if you are capable if you are a good bracer if you have really sound technique do i think that you need to directly train your abs i do not um, however, I think that training apps, the core is really important to functionality, really important to progress, especially as you start to reach the upper echelon of athletes, right? The, the more advanced you get in whatever sport, whether it be a functional dynamic sport, or it'd be more of a stagnant, um, you know, just like powerlifting or your anesthetic athlete, et cetera, the higher up you get the propensity while training to injure yourself, especially as it pertains to your ability to brace and stabilize gets higher, right? So, um, supplementary work for your core is going to become a bit more advantageous for you to implement. Um, but early on for, for young athletes, young being anyone just starting in their journey, um, do I think they need to dedicate 30 minutes of their hour long workout to core work because they want abs? No, I don't think that they would be more wise to work on developing really solid technique, breathing techniques and bracing. So, yeah, I, I think that starting from the position of like, what is your goal is really important for this question. Um, for someone who is training three days a week and has a lot of life commitments and just wants to feel better, look better, 
you know, be a normal human being, you probably should not be dedicating 30 minutes for each session for apps or app circuits, right? Like you probably shouldn't be doing like P90X every morning before you go to, to work. And I think that that's, that's an important misconception that gets glossed over just almost haphazardly whenever we're talking about ab training. It's that like how frequently or how hard you train your abs doesn't change the shape of your abs. Often it doesn't even change the functionality of your abs, right? But yeah, you know, it can actually build the ab muscles, but if you're not lean enough, that doesn't matter anyway. So you have to understand what the goal is. If you're a performance athlete, you should probably be training your fucking abs, but you shouldn't just be doing a lot of crunches. You should be doing different types of movements. You should be doing anti-rotation. You should be doing anti-extension. You should be doing dynamic movements like ab wheel rollouts. You should be doing like pikes. You should be doing like hanging leg raises, like, like plank holds, bird dogs, like all that type, like dynamic movements, right? But that is very specific to if you're trying to actually improve your ab stability or your core stability or your core integration or whatever the fuck you want to call it, right? There's a lot of different ways that you can view that. But the way that I view the abs is if you're approaching it from the position of improving the rectus abdominis as an aesthetic muscle, trunk flexion extension is the most important thing. But once you get to a sufficient level of muscular development, nothing else you do is going to make that big of a difference, right? So for me, as an example, genetically, I have really well-shaped abs and they're also really well-developed to the point where like, I don't have to do direct ab work to continue to develop my abs. They just look that way if I'm lean enough. And if I do any type of bracing in the gym, right? Granted, I don't train as heavy and as hard as I used to with, you know, the same level of compound movements and, you know, or stability requirements and all those things. But just from whenever I used to do that stuff, I developed a strong enough abdominal complex to where now I'm pretty much good with most things, right? If I just maintain that same level of performance and development, I'm mostly good. I don't really have to go out of my way to do it. Yeah, I still do like, you know, ab rollouts here and there. I still do like crunches here and there or hanging leg raises here and there. Because it's good to go through those movement patterns every once in a while. But like, I don't need to do it for development. It's more for maintenance. It's more for just, again, movement pattern. But if you are someone who wants to bring up your abdominal development, if you want them to pop more on stage or in a photo shoot or on the beach or whatever, yeah, go ahead and train your abs like a normal fucking body part, right? Yeah, if you want to improve your abs, train them with a priority. But you also can't train them for 30 minutes every fucking day. Right. A level of intensity that is required to hypertrophy your abs because the same rules apply for your abs as they do with your pecs. And that's the thing that I don't think most people understand because they're so used to seeing shit like P90X or just like thousand crunches, Bruce Lee like routines where that's it, it looks sexy. Yeah. Because most people can't do it. So there's this like this assumed like roadblock or blockade between normal people and achievement of like Bruce Lee abs. Right. When in reality, it's like, no, bro, just do like fucking like three sets of 20 crunches three times a week. And then over time, like add a little bit of load or, you know, add some volume here or there, or like do some different movements, train your abs in a slightly different way or slightly different flexion pattern over time. Just like if you train your pecs on bench press and push ups and dips, your abs are going to hypertrophy. Like, that's just the way that muscles fucking work. But if you don't care about hypertrophying your abs, you probably don't need to do all that shit, right? It's not going to make you any leaner. It's not going to make your abs pop anymore. It's not going to make them more visible. And that's, I mean, again, this is like the sleep thing where if you ask someone what's more important, training your abs or diet towards ab development or, you know, visible abs or six pack, people are going to be like, oh, obviously diet. But they still continue to eat like shit and go do crunches for three hours every day. Like the the actions don't match the words, right? And I think that that's something that is um, maybe another conversation for another day. But whenever it comes to performance, I do genuinely think that ab training in more, I don't say unconventional ways, but ab training outside of crunches. Yeah very important because your abs are not just your rectus abdominis. You've got 
multiple layers of app muscle. You got your obliques, you got your transverse abdominis. You have to be able to control your abdominal complex in a way that goes beyond just flexing and ex not even extending, but flexing your trunk, right? Because it's just res resisting extension. So that's something I think that is very important for healthy, well-developed, functional abs is understanding how to train them for whatever goal that you're after. Um, but beyond that, if the goal is specifically for muscular development or aesthetics, how you train your abs is not that important, right? It's really not that important because your development is going to be capped by muscle growth rate in general. So as long as you're treating your abs as a normal muscle, you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Um, unconventional ways. It reminds me of the things that I used to try to do and you would always shame me for, um, just extra, but I mean, Hey, listen, I, I like to be dynamic. Um, no, I mean, I think that we kind of covered that really well. I think the big thing that you hit was the inherent mismatch between actions and knowledge, um, which I think again, comes back to, well, when I'm working my abs, I feel the burning and I feel the, I feel, I feel like I'm doing work and then they're sore and I'm like, oh, they're, yeah, exactly. The, the fat's just fucking shredding off, bro. I can fucking feel it. Um, and obviously we understand that it, it, we, we know it doesn't work that way. Right. And like you said, changing the shape of your abs, not something that can happen. Um, you are blessed with being not only like genetically sound with abs, but also lean all the time. Right. I'm not lean all the time. I have fantastic abs and I miss them sometimes, but I'm not lean all the time. And so when I see them, I'm like, ah, let's keep, let's do this. Let's do this. And then come Friday, I'm like pizza. That sounds great, but I don't go do abs the next day. If anything, I get on the treadmill the next day. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think that that is definitely one of those just alignment things that people need to work on and understanding like, Hey, like if you're asking this question because you want better abs, it's, it's not about your training for the most part. Like if you want to be able to see your abs, it's about what you put in your mouth. Yeah. And another thing, just one last point here is if just like with any muscle group, if your abs are a limiting factor for anything else, you need to train them. Yeah. But yeah. you need to train them in a way that is going to strengthen them to the point that they are no longer a limiting factor. So I view abs training very similar to how I view like grip training. Yeah. Right. So if you're, for example, a power lifter and your grip fails every time you go for max effort deadlift, you probably should strengthen your fucking grip before you even worry about what else is going on in your deadlift because it doesn't matter how much you can deadlift in theory or with straps. In a competition, you can't use straps. Right. It's not this theoretical max, it's, are you limited by your grip? If we're performing a squat and every time you get into the hole, your trunk collapses because your abs, your core is so fucking weak that it can't sustain that level of load, then it's not your legs, it's your abs. So you need to strengthen your abs in a way that allows you to complete the movement or complete the set or complete the exercise or the session, whatever the fuck it is, right? Yep. But again, that's going back to the point of like, why are you training your abs to begin with? What is the goal? What is the intent? And we always harp on intent. What is the intent? Yep. Match the execution, match the, match the exercise selection to the intent that you're after. Intent has to be established before anything else. Everything goes off of that, right? So it's like, what is the intent for the session? And then what is the intent for each exercise in that session? And then you start selecting and modifying and plugging and playing around all of that. And then you have an entire workout and you have an entire training week and entire, entire mesocycle, macrocycle. But it really does all stem and build out from what is your fucking goal? What are you trying to do here? Yeah. And then there you can start actually, you know, filling in the gaps. I think that's something, the idea of, bringing up biceps, triceps, abs, like those, those accessory muscles in the way that they operate in the compound pattern is something that's probably not talked about enough. Um, it's funny. I actually think about this, uh, occasionally, and I always think I'm going to make a post about it, but I don't know how to articulate it exactly the way I want to. But when we first started training, my low back was fucked up all the time, bro. And so every time I wasn't training with you, I was at, I would only go to the R pack cause they had, they had the extension machine. They had the back extension machine. And I'm like, okay, I, I need to get my low back to a point that I can keep up here. Cause it's not my fucking quads. It's not my upper back. It's not, it's the fact that I literally start to just crumble in that lower lumbar area. It starts to fatigue over time. And then I'm crippled the next multiple days because my low back's just not strong enough to, to keep up. So, 
um, I was supplementing with like low back extensions for, for quite some time before I was able to say, okay, sweet, like I can keep up throughout the entirety of a session and not be ruined. And so just keeping something like that in, per, in perspective, when you're trying to think about how you're going to bring up supplementary movements, why you're doing them, especially if they are limiting factors in your compound. No, a hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, obviously we can continue talking about that because even you saying that makes me want to talk more about how to address weak points, but we'll leave it at abs because I think that that's a good way to wrap up. So beautiful. We got through three questions in a full hour, about an hour. That's good. That was good. Nice. An hour. We, we, we did our best here. All right. So cool. Now we have, we have a full Q and a, and yeah, maybe we'll do this Q and a stuff a little bit more frequently mm -hmm. since it's a nice little format for us to talk about stuff that no one else cares about. No, I definitely think we will. I mean, obviously some people care, at least one person cares, unless you're asking yourself those questions, which I don't put past you. I do. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in to this edition of the P2 podcast. Like Bryce said, we will try to regularly implement those. So please continue to interact on the Q and A's, whether it be with the P2 coaches on the P2 page, if you have random things that come up, random articles, questions, comments, concerns, et cetera, drop those to us via DM. And if they're good, um, which hopefully they are, we will, you know, address them here and give you guys some more long form answers. Um, but again, thank you very much for tuning in wherever you're tuning in from, and we will see you next time. <laughs>